All right, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm super excited that you guys have come to hang out with me because this class is sort of weird to teach. Uh, I chose it. Uh, I've read some books on this. I don't do it very well. We're going to be talking about what it means to live a grace-paced life. A couple of book recommendations as we get started that I think will be helpful. Uh, and honestly, you're probably going to be uh, more experientially helpful for you because these people have done it a lot better than me are written by a husband and wife pair. Uh, they're available in the Resource Center. One is Reset by David Murray, who is a professor of Old Testament and practical theology at Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary. Uh, he has written, it's just a really helpful, readable book on how men can approach living a life characterized by grace, uh, characterized by certain rhythms that will help to maximize our lives for ministry. And then his wife, I think her name is Shauna, is it Shauna Murray? He and his wife wrote one for women called Refresh. So the colors look similar, covers look similar. One, the men's one reset is yellow. The women's one is teal. It's called Refresh. Uh, it's, again, really, really helpful. Elise has read that one. Uh, similar concepts in both. Uh, but when you're dealing with issues of, of bodily health and things like that, there are just differences between men and women, and they're kind of playing into some of those distinctions uh, as they work through some of the practical advice that they give. I would heartily recommend both to you uh, for, for their helpfulness. And uh, if not the content of this course, at least the, the theory of this course comes in large part from those books. And so uh, I, I think you'll be helped by those. Um, so this, this course is equal parts sort of um, confession on my part, uh, acknowledging that there are some pieces uh, to my life that need to change. Uh, it's, it's, it's partly um, an opportunity for me personally to sort of start to implement some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, but a lot of what we're doing is hopefully setting some really helpful things in front of our eyes that maybe we've not thought about. Uh, because one of the things that I feel like has been a perpetual struggle for Elise and me for the last three years of our marriage and stretching back even into college is whenever somebody asks us how we're doing, our answer is always, oh, we've been better. You know, you, you feel that tension. Uh, life gets hectic and busy, and you, your answer when people ask how you're doing is if you're totally honest, you're like, we've been better. Things are hard. Uh, we're really busy. I wish, just wish we could have a break. You have all those different answers that you give. Uh, maybe you're one of those people. I know people in my own family that are this way who mark off the dates to their next vacation, and every day they go to work, they're just marking them away. This is where we want to be. This is the next step. This is finally we can live the life that we want to live. There's all kinds of different ways of thinking about life and the way that we interact with the world. Um, but I think for all of us, we know that there are things that we, that we need to change. Right? We feel the tension of busyness. We feel the tension of relationships that are hard. We feel the tension of time that we don't feel like we have control of. Uh, where there's a lot of things that we want to do that we think are really important. There are a lot of things theologically that we would affirm are very important that in practice just seem to slip away in the midst of all the other things that we're trying to keep in front of us. And this course is my best attempt to think with you and to sort of invite you into sort of some of my thinking on these things as I'm trying to implement things in this transitional period of my life as we finish seminary and have a baby coming in February and, and try to figure out what looks like what life looks like coming up next. This is my attempt to kind of meditate on what Scripture teaches, and hopefully as we kind of work through these things together, you'll be encouraged and you'll hear some things that you can begin to work through in your life. Um, the pieces of what we're talking about are going to be intensely practical at times. I'm not trying to teach a theology course on some of these things, in part because everything that I'll address in this course has been addressed by, more fully by people much more qualified than me to talk about. Uh, but what I hope to do is to use some of what's available to us outside of Scripture, some of what's available to us just experientially, but especially what's told to us in Scripture to help us to catch a vision for what a grace-paced life looks like. So our objective for this course is sort of simple. Uh, through the principles discussed in this course, we hope to maximize our lives, so things like our gifts, time, energy, and relationships for the glory of God. We're looking to maximize our lives, every aspect of our lives, for the glory of God. I think most of us compartmentalize parts of our life to reflect certain priorities. Uh, you know, our, our church time is Sunday morning when we're here and Sunday night when we're at community group. 
Uh, maybe you're involved in different ways on Wednesday nights. Uh, perhaps you have, a, and I hope you do, and we'll talk about some of that this morning. Perhaps you have a personal devotional time, a quiet time, whatever language you want to use, where you're trying to get alone with God. Uh, that's part of your, your personal devotional life. Uh, but on the whole, by and large, uh, most of us have sort of set those things into one area of life, and we sort of function without uh, an, an acknowledgement of the importance of the glory of God and others. Uh, I do that. And I'm, I spend all my time, I work at a church, I'm a seminary student, uh, you know, and, and I, you know, when I'm not doing one of those things officially, I'm doing something probably related to those two things. Uh, and so when you're doing all those different responsibilities and tasks, uh, even, even in, when you're doing ministry, it's easy to not do things for the glory of God. You do them for yourself, you do them for your boss, you do them for your family, you do them for all these other people that are really good, uh, but what you discover is that you're, max, you're not maximizing your life for the glory of your God. You're maximizing your life for yourself or for somebody else. And I think we're going to find that um, that's just not a great way to live. Uh, the, the, the passage of Scripture that I want to keep in front of our eyes throughout this entire course, one that we'll come back to at different points, is from 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 10. Uh, you can see it on the screen if you want to turn there. I'm going to read this, and then we'll pray together before we jump into our specific topic today. Uh, but this passage um, is, I think, one of the most important passages for conceiving what it looks like to live a life characterized by godliness, characterized by those qualities that should be consistent with being a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is, I think, a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, the goal that this class is striving for uh, in a biblical sense. So this, is, this is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. That statement, rather, train yourself for godliness is our priority here. We want to develop disciplines and routines and habits that are going to afford us maximal opportunity to bring glory to God. And that's what we're going to pray that the Lord will do in us through this course. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this time that we have together. Uh, Lord, I'm humbled that, I, that I'm even teaching this course because we're going to talk about things uh, that I don't do well. We're going to talk about things that all of us don't do very well. Hopefully, we're going to be convicted and challenged by what we hear. Uh, but Lord, I pray that that conviction is not one that just uh, lingers in our mind for a few hours or even for a few weeks, uh, but this, that it's one that takes root as we see your word uh, for, for all that it says and as we hear your voice and all that you're saying to us in it. Lord, help us to, to, to develop characteristics and habits of a grace-paced life that will enable us to maximize ourselves for your glory and for your honor and in the ministries to which you've called us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to talk about a variety of different topics. You'll see a schedule in the booklets that I've made available to you. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about the one that I think is foundational, uh, spiritual disciplines in the grace-based life. But hopefully in the coming weeks, you'll, th you'll see things uh, that will be really helpful to you. I think for all of us, different weeks are going to hit us a little bit harder than, than others. So spiritual disciplines, maybe you feel like you're doing great there. Uh, and I hope that you are. Uh, but we'll also hit things like rest in the grace-paced life, one that I've struggled with for a long time. Uh, I get rest, but it's inconsistent. You know, I'm one of those people that have three hours of sleep one night and then 12 the next and then six one night, and I just kind of keep rolling, and hopefully I'll catch up at some point. Uh, some of you, we're talking about rec recreation. We're talking about playing, which sounds really weird, uh, honestly, to think about, but I think it's a really important thing for us to think about as Christians. Uh, one of the things that the reformers, for example, talked about a lot was making use of God's common means of grace as Christians. God created good things for us to enjoy. And obviously we want to enjoy those within the restraints set upon us by Scripture. We want to enjoy them in a godly way. But God has given us good things to enjoy. There's, there's nothing wrong with enjoying a uh, Kentucky Wildcats basketball game on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, there is nothing wrong with uh, enjoying a good meal. Uh, there's nothing wrong with 
uh, enjoying uh, playing with your kids. There's nothing, I mean, there's all these different things. We want to talk about recreation from a godly perspective, and I want to encourage you to take advantage as you try to cultivate habits of a grace-based life to play uh, and to do it in a way that glorifies God. We'll talk about stewardship in the grace-based life, which we're talking especially about bodily stewardship that week. Um, that's going to be a convicting week for me for different reasons, uh, but stewarding our bodies is something that's very, that's, that can be very difficult for some of us more than others. Um, but we want to we want to steward ourselves, our bodies, our time uh, to to maximize our lives. Um, one of the things uh, John Owen, who's a famous Puritan, sort of the archetypal theological Puritan from the 17th century in England, uh, died young. And one of the reasons he probably died is because uh, he didn't steward his body well as a young man. Uh, he didn't get a lot of rest. He was sleeping three to four hours a night because he was so focused on his studies, and he died in his 40s. And Part of what we want to consider in this course is, all right, I'm playing a long game here. You know, we can die when we're 48 and have had 20 years or 30 years of productive ministry and relationships and all those different things. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, it's better, I would think, we would agree to live till you're 78 and have 60 years and to work at two-thirds of the pace uh, and ultimately get to do more. It's just math. So we want to talk about stewardship of our bodies and try to maximize our lives there. The last couple of weeks, we'll talk about work, and then we'll talk about relationships. These things will mix together in different ways throughout our time. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about spiritual disciplines. Uh, I would love to spend time talking about preaching and its importance in your spirituality and your godliness. Uh, we'll talk about, I'll mention that briefly, but we're primarily going to save that for the last week, because I think it's really important. So, uh, I hope that as we walk through this course, you're going to find things helpful, uh, and that that you're going to be uh, challenged to grow in some ways that maybe you've not thought about before. Uh, I also, though, want to sort of set things in context. These things are sort of building on each other in different ways. Uh, but the foundational one that we're going to talk about today is spiritual disciplines in the Christian life. Uh, because one of the things that I think is characteristic of me, and it's probably characteristic of you, is that if we really admit where we're struggling is in our walk with Christ. A lot of us know that at a fundamental level, we have a hard time keeping up with reading our Bibles and prayer. Uh, maybe for you, there's, it's usually one more than the other, right? Some of us are really routine and regimented, and we can sit down and we can knock out a Bible reading plan, and you're like, I'm doing the ones where you have to read like 10 passages of Scripture, and I've read the Bible three times already this year, and that's great. Uh, maybe you're one of those people who... You know, reading the Bible is something that you get to, but you're just constantly in a state of prayer. You know, you're, 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 you live your life. You get in the car, and it's almost like part of your routine is you turn the key, and, and you're immediately in just the silence of the moment, praying and lifting things up to God. Uh, maybe you're like me, and you're neither of those people, <laughs> and you're somewhere in the middle, and, and you catch yourself in really good seasons and really bad seasons. And, uh, and, and you admit that when you look at your life, the very first thing that you know that you need to address to cultivate a grace-based life is you need to work on spiritual disciplines. You need to work on making priorities out of the things that are the most important. Because the reality is, is that uh, the, spiritual, the spiritual disciplines must receive priority in the grace-based life. If you want to live a life that's characterized by grace, you need the spiritual disciplines. These are the disciplines that God uses to build up his people, as we'll see when we look through some different passages of Scripture. Uh, these are the means by which Christians pursue godliness. These are the means by which Christians pursue godliness. If the goal of your life is the glory of God, if the goal of your life is to look more like Jesus, if the goal of your life is to grow in personal holiness, you're not going to do that without the spiritual disciplines. They are absolutely foundational, even though for many of us they're glaringly absent from the way that we live day by day. Um, it is helpful for us, though, to consider what they are. When we're talking about the spiritual disciplines, when we're talking about especially scripture reading and prayer and then accompanying that, some other things, uh, we're talking about in those quiet times and those personal devotions, you're meeting with God himself, right? We're meeting with God. We're having personal communion with the living God. And, and we can make time for all these other things in our lives that are important, but when we look at everything that we could be doing in a day, if somebody were to tell you that you could have personal communion with the living God, that you could have a relationship, that you could have time, that he, 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 he was listening to you and he was speaking to you, then I think you would hopefully want to push aside everything else for that. 
I mean, I, I know in, in marriage that when Elise has something important that she wants to say to me, that one of my responsibilities is pushing aside everything else to listen to her. But more than that, it's a joy and a pleasure for me to be able to give her that attention and focus time. It's a joy for me to enjoy the intimacy of marriage, that relationship that only we have, that nobody else has with, with one of us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and it's a joy and it's, it's, a, it's a gift from God to be able to do that. And I hope if you're married here and you think through your relationship with your spouse, you know that that's a priority. You push aside everything else to give attention to your spouse. Maybe to sort of draw things out, maybe there's, you know, we all have sort of in different ways celebrity or historical figure admiration. My father-in-law is a history guy. Um, If George Washington came out of the grave and wanted to have a conversation with him, he would knock aside everything else in his life to be able to have that conversation. That's the level of priority and privilege that he would associate with that opportunity. He would say, this is a great thing. The living God of the universe has spoken to us, and we can hear from him anytime we want. And he has invited us through Christ as our intercessor to speak to him whenever we want. And yet, we have a hard time doing it. Uh, I have a hard time doing it, right? Right? It's, I, maybe we're spoiled for opportunities. Maybe we aren't aware of the privilege that's ours in Christ to engage and interact with the living God. I don't know what the situation is. I don't know how to articulate what goes on in my heart other than that I still struggle with the effects of sin and I still fail to see the tremendous privilege that's in front of me. But this should be the first thing that we think about. As you're constructing your life and your routines and what your day-to-day and week-to-week and month-to-month and year-to-year looks like, I want to argue that the thing that should be the central focus of your day, the thing that should receive time priority, energy priority, relational priority over everything else is your time spent with God. We'll talk about times of day, but I want to go ahead and say that whatever time of day that you reserve for, for the best of yourself, the most energy you have, the biggest level of focus and commitment that you have, and this is a rebuke to myself too, we give that to work or we give that to relationships or we give that to school or we give that to all these different things. But I want to challenge you and set before you the fact that we really need to be giving that time to, to God. And in that, we'll find incredible opportunities for growth and development and godliness. The spiritual disciplines must receive priority in a grace-paced life. Let me walk you through some important sort of foundational considerations as we think through what this life looks like uh, with the spiritual disciplines. Uh, I think we've probably heard this talk a lot. Uh, You've heard people say a lot of the things that I've already said. I hope nothing that I'm saying is new to you. Uh, It's certainly not new to me. Uh, But it is important uh, that we understand why we keep saying it why we keep going to these issues, Uh, because they're hard at times, and they require a lot of thought, uh, but but we need to have some foundational things in front of us before we move forward. So what are some important considerations as we think about the spiritual disciplines in a grace-paced life? Well, first of all, the spiritual disciplines are biblical. The spiritual disciplines are biblical. Uh, I, I I don't know about you, but I've heard the arguments, stretching back to when I was in high school, that uh, I, I have a relationship and I don't, I don't have a religion and that's used as some kind of justification for I'm not going to do the right thing in the right time because I have a relationship with Jesus and I'm like well if you have a relationship you do some stuff right you, you spend time in the word you spend time in prayer uh, there's this sort of implicit you know there's no biblical requirement that I get up every day and that I spend time with the Lord there's no requirement in the New Testament that I spend this much time every day, that I spend 20 minutes reading scripture and 10 minutes praying. Uh, so, so maybe we're challenged to, to consider, okay, is this even a biblical priority? And I would tell you that in the same way when we talk about financially giving things, what, the way the New Testament kind of ups the ante and just says, hey, you know, it's not about 10%. It's about a spirit. It's about an attitude. It's about being a cheerful giver. It's giving everything you can for the sake of Christ and his church. Uh, I think this is true for the spiritual disciplines as well. One of the reasons we don't see a specific sort of requirement of this is how much time you should spend in the Word, this is how much time you should spend in prayer, is that ultimately 
it should be as much as we can give. It should be as much as we can give. That should be a priority in our lives. So the spiritual disciplines are biblical. Let me show you some examples of where we see the spiritual disciplines as characteristic commitments of Christ in this church and the scriptures. First of all, Christ models a commitment to the spiritual disciplines. So if the goal for us is to, is to bring glory to God, if the goal for us as is, is New Testament believers is to be conformed to the image of Christ, then we probably ought to look at the example of Christ and see what Christ does. So Christ affirms and demonstrates uh, the importance of the spiritual disciplines. He affirms and demonstrates the importance of Scripture. So in the Gospel of John, uh, we see Jesus showing the priority of Scripture in his life and ministry, and it, it, we see him demonstrating how important it is in his interactions with the religious leaders. This is from uh, John 10, 31 through 38. This is what we read. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, it is, is it not written in your law, I said you were gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. A couple of statements there are sort of remarkable. One is that Jesus flatly says, and Scripture cannot be broken. If you read in the ESV, there's, like, there's, there's M dashes around it, which is sort of highlighting it in the text. Jesus is making an aside statement there. He's saying, and Scripture cannot be broken. This is a fundamental theological perspective that Jesus expresses in a number of places. But one of the remarkable things about what Jesus is doing in this passage is he's using Scripture to prove his point. He's not saying, when, when he refers to the Psalms and refers to the sons of God, he's not saying, I am not the son of God, or, and, or, that, or that you are sons of God, and I, we're, all, we're all sons of God. What he's saying is, you're mad at me for saying that I'm the son of God. But if you actually knew your Bible, and you actually affirmed its importance and read it, you would see that God uses the language of sons of God to apply to you. Jesus is just showing the, the degree to which the religious leaders have neglected the scriptures, but he's also showing the depth of his own understanding. You see, Jesus, we don't, we don't read about, except for a couple of instances, we don't read about Jesus reading the Bible. We, we, hear, we read about him reading it in public at the beginning of his ministry, uh, but we don't have a lot of examples, or, or, or it was probably pretty unlikely that Jesus is walking around with a big set of scrolls under his arm <laughs> around Israel, uh, folding them out and reading the Bible all the time. But as a, as a, as a, as a person of an oral culture, he's grown up uh, in accordance with the Jewish law in the synagogue. The, the scriptures are so fundamental to the way that Jesus as a man perceives the world that he shows us the priority of scripture. That the fact that, the, that this is Jesus, who, who at 12 years old was sitting in the temple debating issues in the law, with the leading teachers of Israel. This is the same Jesus who repeatedly, throughout his ministry, challenges the understandings of the greatest religious leaders of his time in pointing out what the scriptures mean. Uh, we may not be able to point to specific examples of Jesus reading the Bible as part of his daily life, but we can point to plenty of examples of Jesus using and showing that he has a fundamentally biblical perspective on the world. Of course, when we speak to his divinity, we also know that it's about him and that he inspired it. But Jesus shows us in his example how important the scriptures are. In, in other passages, he uses similar statements. Uh, in Matthew 22, 29, he says to the Sadducees, uh, you are wrong because you, neither, uh, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So Jesus answers them in another issue with this reminder that they don't know the scriptures. Jesus shows his knowledge of scripture over and over and over again. It's sort of a rebuke to us then that if Jesus is showing the priority of Scripture in his life and ministry, that when he doesn't even have a copy of, like, a physical copy of the Scriptures in this size, I mean, this almost fits in my pocket. Uh, he's not carrying those around with him, but, but this is so fundamental to who he is that maybe this should change our perspective a little bit too, especially since most of us have multiple physical copies of Scripture in our home, or at the very least, we have a, a smartphone, uh, a device that we can carry around and read Scripture whenever we want. Perhaps the most incredible demonstration of the priority that Jesus gave to Scripture, though, is when he is dealing with Satan in the temptation account. I, I don't 
I, I think that that's, when, when I read passages of Scripture, that's just one of the most like, glorious and comforting passages that you can read, seeing the way that Jesus, uh, in representing, in some ways, Israel representing us, just vanquishes the enemy and resists all the temptations that he throws at him. It's super comforting. But then you see the way that Jesus handles Scripture, and you know your own sin, and you're like, I suck. I'm not good at this. I don't know anything. Here, here Jesus is in you know the very beginning of his ministry. He's 30 years old. Uh, I'm 25, and I've been in theological education for seven years. And I don't, I don't find myself in moments of temptation going, Scripture says X. But here's Jesus in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Listen to all the times Jesus responds with Scripture. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered him, uh, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written. Scripture quote. Scripture quote about Scripture, actually. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God... Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest your, uh, you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, more scripture, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. When the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. I mean, you just see, with a word, Jesus is answering Satan, but he's not answering them with a word that he's pulling out of the top of his head, even though he could, and that would be totally appropriate because he's God. He's answering him with Scripture. And besides all the other things that we could say about what Jesus is doing, if there's any question in your mind as to whether spending time in Scripture is worthwhile, the example of Jesus shows us that spending time in Scripture should be one of the first priorities of your life. It should be one of the first priorities of my life. Because it's in our engagement with Scripture that we become like Jesus, and we're able to live like Jesus. We're able to be like Jesus. We're able to become the people that God has created us to be. Of course, Jesus also demonstrates the importance of prayer. We see a lot about Jesus' prayer life that we can speak to. Jesus models prayer, and he models prayer at every time of day. Luke five fifteen through 16, we read, But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. This speaks to a habit, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Jesus in this expanding ministry, people crowding around him, wanting to see him, wanting to interact with him, he makes it a priority to withdraw from the people and pray. We also see other texts where, where Jesus is, is, is praying. We see, for example, that he prays in the morning. Mark one thirty five. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. We see him praying in the afternoon. Immediately he made the disciples get into uh, the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. What we discover later on is that evening comes, and that's when Jesus walks on the water. Uh, this is from Matthew 14, 22 through 23a. So Jesus prays in the morning, he prays in the afternoon, he prays in the evening. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. That's from Luke six twelve. Jesus is all about prayer. He does it all the time. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where like, it's almost like if you're, if you're in the kind of the mindset of the disciples, you're almost probably frustrated by it because you're like, how much can you pray? There's so many people around that have all these different needs. There's so much that we need to do. There's so much that God is, it, it, there's so much that needs fixing. I mean, look at us. We're in captivity under Rome. They're crucifying us on the outside of our holy city. You know, when are you going to bring the political revolution? When are you going to heal all these people who are sick? When are you going to take down the empire? All these different things that are probably running through the disciples' minds, and Jesus is just going, I'm going to pray. And we feel frustrated in that. 
But maybe instead of feeling frustrated with the disciples, we should see the rebuke that's coming to us. That Jesus makes a priority of prayer in the midst of all the busyness and all the responsibility of his life. That Jesus spends his last hours of freedom before he's arrested and taken into trial and then crucified in prayer. Maybe prayer should take a, a key place in our lives as well. And then Jesus teaches us how to pray. Uh, we, we're all familiar with the Lord's Prayer. Most of us have probably memorized it from Matthew, where Jesus gives it as part of the Sermon on the Mount. But we also have witness in the Gospel of Luke to him speaking to the issue of prayer and teaching his disciples. In Luke 11, 1 through 4, we read, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So Jesus takes the time. The disciples see the the prayerfulness of Jesus and say, show us how to do this. Jesus shows us the priority of prayer. So purely in the example of Jesus, we see that the spiritual disciplines are biblical The apostles again reaffirm that in their own writings. The apostle Paul, for example, affirms the importance of the Bible in our in our life. In 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, Paul says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul also affirmed the importance of prayer. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 1 Thessalonians five sixteen through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What we see in the example of Jesus and the apostles who follow them is that Scripture and prayer are of the utmost importance to every part of our lives. That these need to be things that that we're committed to, that they're biblical, and that they are fundamental to our following Jesus ourselves. So as you're building out your vision of what a grace-paced life looks in your context, just purely on the level of a biblical commitment, this is the piece that I want to encourage you to place first. Set this one in stone. Make this commitment. And then build the rest of your life out from that. Just as Christ should be the center of everything that you do, your time with Christ, your communion with Christ, your, your, your quiet time, your personal devotion, your scripture reading and prayer should be the central focus of your day, even if they happen on the very end or beginning of your day. Well, we can also speak, though, to some other issues pertaining to the spiritual disciplines. The spiritual disciplines are biblical, but they're also habitual. They're also habitual. We saw that with Jesus, that Jesus was in the habit of praying. He would go out that language is strategic there. He would withdraw to desolate places, places and pray. Um, but just on a level of practical considerations and concerns, as we think about our pursuit of godliness and training ourselves for godliness, Paul uses that language in 1 Timothy chapter 4 for a reason. He says, train yourself uh, for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of tr- value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The imagery of athletes training is a consistent one in Scripture. Uh, Now, I've not done a whole lot of athletic training in my life, but what I will say is that I know that it requires commitment and routine, Uh, that it's a habit, and that when you make those habitual changes to the way that you live your life, things start to sort of shift and change more and more over time. When I was in college, I lost about 85 pounds, and it was a matter of little changes that just built up on each other over time. And you gain it back by little changes that you lapse over time. Uh, But when you make habitual changes in your life, uh, you can see massive shifts in the way that you live. We want to build and develop a routine for our pursuit of godliness. 
we don't want to leave this up to chance. Because the fact of the matter is, Jesus is consistent in prayer in ways that will never be, and Jesus is consistent in his focus on Scripture in ways that will never to be, never be because he's without sin. And constantly, sin and, and spiritual powers of darkness are going to be berating your mind with all these different things that you need to do and that you need to give priority in your life. You're not going to have, at any point of this life, a pure desire at all times to be in God's Word and to be in prayer. You're going to constantly be struggling. So we need to understand our sin, and we need to understand ourselves enough to know that we need to give consistent and specific time to the spiritual disciplines. We need to give consistent and, and uh, consistent time to the spiritual disciplines. That means that we need to prioritize certain things in our lives. Fundamental to this is we need to, that we need to prioritize privacy in our pursuit of the spiritual disciplines. So I mentioned that one of the things that you've got to think through, that we've got to think through, is, is what time of day are we going to make this an important thing for us? What, what time of day is a, is, a, is a focal time for us as we think about our pursuit of Christ, and how should we consider the various factors that are in play there as you're building out your time? Well, there are a variety of factors that have different weight. One of the first ones you've got to think about is privacy. Right? If you're going to pursue intimacy in your relationship with God, you've got to be able to get away. For some of you, that's easier than others. It's very easy for me to get privacy. I'm a part-time employee at a church. I'm a full-time, a full-time online student. I do other work uh, that I can do from home. So when Elise goes to work, I've got on um, three days a week, eight hours of complete privacy that I can do, you know, whatever I need to do. So that maybe becomes easy for me. Maybe for you, that's a little more challenging. Maybe only private times you have are either early in the morning before, you know, family gets out of bed or late at night after family is in bed. I don't know what that looks like for you, but an important piece of your life is figuring out when you have that time, prioritizing privacy, getting alone with God so that you have that time. That's where the the, the example of Jesus is helpful. People will tell you, oh, if you're going to prioritize the spiritual disciplines in your life, if you're going to make these things habitual for you, then then the very first thing you need to think about is you got to get up early in the morning. And and I'm going to tell you that that doesn't work for everybody. That does not work for Elise. Elise is not an early morning person. It's, uh, she's tried, but honestly, she knows that if she gets up, I'm frustrated because I am an early morning person, and I'm like, this is my time. Like, I'm, so I'm like, I'll make your breakfast. You get out of bed, and like, you roll out of bed. And everything's ready. We're good for the day. Like, you sleep. I got this. Like, we have different schedules, and, 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 it's, and it's not helpful for us to look at the example of Jesus in Mark 135 and say, uh, oh, you know, Jesus gets up early in the morning. So that's the time for you, because Jesus prays early in the morning, and he prays in the afternoon, and he prays at night. What you need to do is you need to look at your, your life, you need to look at your time, you need to look at your, your, your body, you can consider the way your body's rhythms work, and you need to figure out what time of day is your most energized, what time of day is your most available and open, what time of day is your most private, and you need to say, this is the time that I'm going to give to the Lord. For me, and I've not done this successfully, I typically do my quiet time, personal devotions at night, but I've learned just in sort of repetition that the best time for me to actually give attention to God and the things of God is probably about three o'clock in the afternoon. It's because in the morning, I get up, my brain is racing, it takes me forever to kind of clear out all the different things that I need to be thinking about for the day and get organized and get ready to go. At night, that's Elisa's time, like I'm accustomed to that. She's going to go to bed before I'm ready to, but, but one of the commitments that and I've sort of followed Dr. York's lead, he talks about this, I go to bed with Elise as often as I'm able to. Uh, if I stay up after her, it's because I've got work or school things that I need to do, but my priority is being with her in that time. The best time for me to spend time with the Lord is in the afternoon. It's not the most convenient time, depending on your job. That may not be an option for you, but it's the time when I have the most energy. It's the time when my mind is the most clear. It's the time where I have extensive privacy and it's a time where, um, you know, I, I just, the, the focus is there in a way that it's not in other parts of the day. So I want to challenge you as you think through more issues, and we're going to talk about more practical steps. Just identify that time. Figure out where in your day you need to place that, what options you have. Uh, we babysat 
for a family. Uh, the, the dad was a, was a professor at Union, and, they had, and he and his wife had four kids. Uh, they were, at the time we babysat, nine, seven, five, and three. Uh, Elise stayed at their house. I stayed on campus and then came over to their house at like eight in the morning and stayed until they were at bed at night. And it was a, it was a full bore effort for like four days. It was crazy. Uh, great training, I think. Uh, but one of the things that they did in the afternoon is they had what they called rest time. They didn't have to take a nap, but they had to go into their rooms and they could take books or they could listen to audio books or whatever they needed to do. And they had to be quiet. And that gave space and time for their mom, and in this case for Elise, to just catch her breath. Well, looking at my life, you know, if I were in that situation, that would be the ideal time for me to do a quiet time, to, to sort of build my schedule and my day around that. I don't know what your options are. I don't know what your schedules look like. I would just tell you that no matter what your situation, think about what it looks like to take that time. My dad is a, I know some of you in here are teachers, uh, my mom and dad are both educators. My dad is an administrator. My mom is a preschool teacher. Uh, they do a variety of different things. Mom does her quiet times super early in the morning because she gets to school at like 7.15 uh, to set up her room for the day. My dad, uh, for years, did a lot of his stuff while he was driving. He had a job that forced him to drive to all these county schools, so he was going all over the place. Uh, he would read his Bible at his desk in the morning, sort of mid-morning, and then he would drive and pray as he was driving because that was the time that he knew he was going to be focused and attentive. It was a time to calm himself a lot of times before he stepped into difficult situations in schools. So, I, I, again, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just kind of give you, giving you a broad spectrum, but there are a lot of different things that you can do. Maybe you can sit at your desk at 10 a.m. because you know that I can clear aside 30 minutes at this time. This is a dead time for us in the office. Maybe it's during your lunch break. Maybe you have a, an hour lunch break, and... Everybody else clears out and goes to restaurants, and you know, hey, I can take I can take 30 minutes and eat, and 30 minutes and pray and be in scripture. Uh, maybe it's if you're if you stay at home. Uh, maybe it, again, it's it's getting up before the kids get up and just going at it that way. Uh, if you do homeschool stuff, and uh, you know, again, this is all speculative. I don't have I, we're not really we haven't really even thought about homeschool stuff yet. But if we or any kind of school stuff, but uh, if you do homeschool stuff. Maybe there's a way that you can build into your, in your routine that day. Um, I know my, my aunt homeschooled in the afternoons. That was a key time for her. Uh, that's when everything kids had to go outside. That was science time. Go outside and do something. Get out of my hair. <laughs> and she had that time to herself. Again, I don't know what that looks like for you. Uh, but make a habit of what those things are. If I give you any challenges, it's on the screen. But my challenge for you this week is not even for you. I hope that you will go and you'll spend time in the Word and in prayer. But my challenge for you this week as we come back next week is to take some time and look at your calendar, figure out your routines, be attentive to your body this week and how your body works, and, and figure out what that best time for you is as you look to, to pursue godliness in your, in your walk with Christ. Uh, the spiritual disciplines are habitual. But all that said... That's not going to make it happen. And honestly, we're not going to make it happen on our own because the spiritual disciplines are spiritual. I could use a capital S there. Spiritual disciplines are spiritual. The spirit of God who, who, who dwells with us, who lives with us, who indwells us uh, in accordance with the uh, ascension of Christ. The spirit comes and dwells all of the followers of Jesus Christ. The spirit dwells in you if you're a follower of Christ and he helps you. You're not going to be successful in your pursuit of these spiritual disciplines or in any part of the grace-paced life apart from the help of the Spirit. The Spirit empowers you to pursue the various means for godliness. The Spirit makes your reading of Scripture effective. And all the cobwebs that sin sort of puts in place in your mind, the fact that you can get anything from this beyond maybe an academic knowledge of what's there, the fact that the Spirit that, that you experience change as you interact with God's Word, that's the Spirit's work. And then, and then as you, as you pray, as, as you look to make your request known to God, what we see in Scripture is that the Spirit is, even when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit is, is, is praying for us, interceding for us with unutterable groans. The Spirit prays on our behalf in some different ways. So ultimately, as we think about the spiritual disciplines, we can, we can have the biblical justification. We can talk about habits and how we're going to get at this and, and what we want to do. But ultimately, none of it's going to be any good if we're not empowered by the Spirit. So I would tell you, as we think about the spiritual nature of the, of the, of the spiritual disciplines, pray for help. 
pray for help. Don't, don't just think, oh, I got this. You know, I've got to make a plan. Uh, this is something that just sort of rocked my world when I was in undergrad. We would do these exegetical papers where we'd pick a passage, and we'd have all this work to do. There'd be 18 steps, and, you know, we're in, we're in Greek, so we're, like, rolling through Greek passages and translations and figuring out all these grammatical things, and we're doing semantic diagrams and all this stuff that is, like, you know, it's awesome and fun for me. It may not be for you, but I love this stuff. But I had a professor, and it, and it like, uh, I, didn't under, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I had this professor that said the first step of your exegetical work is to pray. Before you sit down and look at that passage, before you start thinking through the different things that are going on in language there, or the different theological emphases that are happening, or the context, or before you, before you start even thinking about how this applies to you, take some time to pray. So as we turned in our exegetical work, we had to write out a prayer at the beginning of what we were doing to highlight the fact that we were dependent on the Spirit of God to make this effective. You're not writing an exegetical paper. I'm not writing a lot of exegetical papers anymore. Elise is really glad that that's true. Whatever you're doing, though, you're, you're reading Scripture and you're praying, and ultimately you have to understand that in everything you're dependent on the Spirit of God to enable you to do all of those things. So pray before you pray, <laughs> and pray before you read the scriptures, and ask, our, ask for God's help. We are, we are totally dependent on the grace of God as we pursue these spiritual disciplines. So I'm going to pause and ask for questions before we go to some intensely, hopefully practical things for us to think through uh, as we jump in. Any questions or comments that we can walk through? Again, in full disclosure, I don't have, any, I don't have a lot of experiential advice for you. I'm learning with you, and it's honestly, it's in some ways just an excuse for me to have to every week think really hard about this so that I do a better job. But if you have questions, I'm happy to answer to the best of my ability. Let's move forward to practical things then. So as we think about scripture reading, uh, we want to talk about some principles and some practices as we, as we approach scripture reading. So what are some principles for scripture reading? What are some basic commitments that we have to think about? Well, again, I think 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, is, it's formative as we think about principles for Scripture. If you've taken classes with me, with me before, I beat this drum of this passage all the time just because I think it's super important to everything else that we do in theology and biblical studies and, and practical theology, relationships, counseling, everything. It's, all, it's, it's vital to how we understand who we are and what we're doing. Uh, it's all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what are some principles for scripture reading? Well, first of all, we need to hear from God. We need to hear from God. More than you need to hear from anybody else in this world, you need to hear from God. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a foundational reality that we've got to think about. Again, a thing I don't do well, but that I think is really important, is the first thing we do in the morning shouldn't be to check our phones so that the first people we're hearing from are Twitter or Facebook or boss or, you know, whatever issues are coming up. Uh, I, I work for people that work late sometimes, and so I'll wake up. If I go to bed at 1030, I'll wake up at, at 630, and I'll have, you know, a ton of emails of things that have just kind of come up. Um, Scott does. So Scott will like time our emails sometimes to come to us, so he does interrupt our evenings. But we get them first thing in the morning, and I have to resist that urge to go and look at that to see what's what's there, a and it's hard. Um, but we need to hear from God more than we need to hear from anybody else. Uh, we need to hear from God more than He needs to hear from us. I don't know if you think about that very often. We are, and I don't know why it's doing that. I'm sorry. Uh, the TV is flickering a little bit. Uh, but we need to hear from God uh, more, th more than he needs to hear from us. We are intensely selfish people most of the time, and we love to hear ourselves talk. I can tell you that I think one of the hardest things about seminary that I'm really coming to realize at the end of my time in seminary is just how selfish I am, that it's so easy for me when people say, how are you, not to even ask them how they're doing, because I'm like, well, I got a paper due, and 
Um, there's this big theological debate over whether or not you can use medicine and psych- and counseling and and uh, well, Elise is Elise is really busy at work, and you go through all these different pieces of your life that you're like, this is it sounds like life's terrible, and it's really not. But what that what that underscores is that I just really like to talk about myself sometimes, and I'm not very conscious of where other people are. We can do the same thing in our devotional life, where we come to scripture and we we quickly sort of knock out whatever that scripture reading is for the day on our Bible reading plan, and we go, all right, God, now to the important stuff. Let me tell you what I need from you, and really. We need to sort of switch that. We need to hear from God more than we need to more than He needs to hear from us. God's not going to be changed by what you pray. God doesn't change. God, in His sovereignty, chooses to work through our prayers to accomplish His sovereign purposes. But He does whatever He pleases because He's in the heavens. Ultimately, He's not going to be changed by what we say, but we will be changed by what He says. So your first priority needs to be hearing from God. His he, his priority is ultimately, unless it's not hearing from us. Yes. Yes, we're going to get there. The yes, we're going to get there. So so what what I'm going to talk about is is using the Bible as sort of a springboard for prayer. Yeah. So uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. That's a good question. Uh, I'm gonna I'm what I'm gonna what I'm gonna argue is that. Scripture reading and prayer are, are, are really working together as a conversation, and we want to give God the first word. And so we're responding in prayer to what he said to us, but we'll get there. Um, so we need to hear from God. And theologically, biblically, we can affirm that Scripture, as Paul says in, in 2 Timothy three sixteen and following, Scripture is breathed out by God. It is the very word of God given to us as the Spirit moves to the writers of Scripture so that their words were his. So we need to hear from God. More than that, we need to hear all that God has spoken to us. We need to hear all that God has spoken to us. And this is an important piece, too, because I, I went through this phase when I was younger, and I'm sure you've been there, too, where you're like, I don't read the Bible really strategically. I just kind of open the Bible and see where it lands and see what the Lord has to say to me in this particular moment. And then you open to, like, the Rape of Tamar or something, and you're like, I don't understand what this has to do with anything in my life right now. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you've done that. Maybe you just keep going back to the Psalms, which is wonderful. Uh, but maybe you have one passage of scripture that's really resonating or has resonated with you for a long time. So every day you read like Psalm 23 and you're just cranking that through. And that's, that's, yeah, that's your Bible reading. Again, that's a great practice. But what I want to say is you need to hear everything that God has said. All scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable. That's an important word. That all scripture from Genesis to Revelation, including Leviticus, is profitable and it matters for you and it's going to help you to grow in godliness. So you need to be in front of all of scripture. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a moment. And the last thing is we need to hear from God often. We need to hear from God often. If we want to be equipped for every good work, if we want to be complete, if we want to be the kind of people that, that Christ is creating us to be, making us to be in him, then we need to hear from God often. We can't neglect this. Uh, we want to give careful attention to what God has said in his word. So what are some practices for scripture reading? Um, a few different practices to mention. First, uh, in order to hear from God, we need to discipline ourselves to read God's word. So this plays into what we said earlier about uh, Developing a routine and habit for approaching God's word. When should I read God's word? So time of day. Again, we talked about those pieces earlier. Where should I read God's word? Again, this is totally sort of based on your experience and what your day looks like. I will tell you that it's probably not the best unless you're super disciplined about this and you like have trouble going to sleep quickly. It's probably not the best idea to like lay back in bed and set your Bible on your chest and try to read scripture at the end of a long day. There are some postures and positions that are helpful. Uh, you don't have to do them, but they're helpful. Uh, even we'll talk about prayer in a moment, but like John Calvin talks about, it's not required, but helpful that you pray with your hands like this because it just, your posture can help to sort of, just as your posture communicates the attitude of your heart, your posture can help sort of shape the attitude of your heart in reverse as in a kind of circular way. Uh, I think where you read God's word, the, literally the physical position you're in, but also the location. So maybe you have a 
corner of your house that's quiet that you can get away to. Uh, maybe it's your desk. Maybe you know that I do my best work at my desk in my office, and so I'm going to sit at the desk, and I'm going to focus on reading Scripture. Uh, uh, for me, like even working here, if, if I were to do my quiet times here, and, I, and I'm not going to, but if I were, I would be much more effective in some places than others. It's not going to be good for me in the, in the office that I work in with three other interns and Scott for me to try to do a quiet time in there because it doesn't get very quiet. And so it's important to step away. But I also know that if I go sit in one of the chairs by the fireplace, then I'm going to fall asleep. And so I go in one of the rooms right around the corner that's got a big conference table, and that's where I do stuff. And I get away from things there. Another thing about where you should read God's Word, or maybe this is more of a how I should read God's Word kind of thing, like maybe set aside your phone. I think there's value in having a physical copy of God's Word. It's wonderful that we have great study tools available on our phones and laptops and iPads and all those things. But having a physical copy of God's Word is just important because it keeps, you, you don't get push notifications on your, on your physical Bible. If you do, I've got concerns. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Uh, but, but separate yourself from those things. You need to consider factors like when and where and how you should read God's Word. Also, in order to hear all that God has spoken, we need a plan. Uh, I've not brought Bible reading plans for you to thumb through today. Um, in part because I'm I'm trusting that that you can find you can you can look those up. There's a Bible reading plan available on the Buckrun app that you can use, uh, and so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, but you need to have a plan. Maybe you want to follow a specific plan. Uh, Robert Murray McShane has a famous plan that he advocated that included uh, readings for personal devotional life and family devotions. That's helpful. Um, you, there's chronological Bible plans that take you from Genesis to Revelation, or I guess that would be sequential. There are time chronological Bible, uh, Bible reading plans that will go from Genesis 1 and 2 to Job to, you know, they'll try to follow like a timeline of what that might have looked like. You can buy the one-year Bible is what Elise uses, and it's great because it gives you those four different readings, and it's right there in front of you, and you've got that Bible, and it's there. Um, I use the, the ESV uh, Reader's Bible. It's six volumes, and it's laid out like a normal book. I use that and really enjoy it, and it has a Bible reading plan that tells you to read pages 3 through 11 today, and it takes the verse numbers out. It's just a text of Scripture, but because, it's, because I spend so much time trying to identify and articulate verse numbers, removing those things out of the way just really helps me to focus on what's happening on the page. Uh, there are all kinds of plans. Maybe your plan is just, I'm going to read a chapter. That's okay. You know, there, it's helpful to have the goal of, I'm going to read the Bible in a year and to really strive for that. But you know what? There's, there's nothing in Scripture that says you have to read the whole Bible in a year. It is, you just need to be in the, in the habit of being in God's Word. So maybe you want to read a chapter. Maybe you want a three-year Bible reading plan. Uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe you want to go really slowly, and you're going to read every passage that Dr. York preaches, and that's going to be every day that week. You're going to come back to that passage. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I want to tell you, you have a plan and make a, and make a point of sticking to that plan. And then pursue accountability. So if, you're, if accountability for you is just check marking on your plan, great. You can't stand to see that empty check mark, perfect. Some of you are that wired that way. If you need to have your spouse or even your kids or, or, or a family member or a friend keep up with it, uh, pursue some accountability there. And then also, and this is the last thing here, and I'm going to move quickly through, the, through, through this and into prayer. In order to hear from God, we need to interact with God's word in various ways. So this addresses, starts to address some of what Jason was asking about earlier, but we need to memorize God's word. So not just read it, but memorize it. Hide it in your heart. You can't respond like Jesus did to Satan unless you have some scripture memorized. So commit yourself to memory of scripture. Uh, meditate on God's word. And, and by meditation, I don't mean like sitting with your legs crossed and going, oh. I mean like we don't empty our minds as Christian meditation. We, we fill our minds with the word of God. So take some time to meditate on scripture. Uh, there are different ways that you can do that. Maybe you need to physically write down some things that you're noticing. Uh, maybe you're like the journaling Bibles and you like to draw and you're, art, you're, you're kind of artsy, which is awesome. Uh, and you have like a thousand colored pencils and you're going to like draw what you're seeing somewhere as you go through the text of scripture. Uh, maybe, maybe you are an in-depth person, so the best thing for you to have is a study Bible and you're going to be going back and forth those study notes, and you're going to be hitting those things up. 
whatever the case may be, spend some time going deeper into Scripture. Consider things like what the text is actually saying, not just what it means to you, but what it actually is saying. Um, consult commentaries and theology books. Study notes in your study Bible. Um, think about how it applies to you. The meaning is fixed, but the application is going to be different for us. So take some time. If you do nothing else, take some time to sort of, in your own words, write out what this passage is saying, and then also write out what I need to take from this. Whatever the case may be, there are different ways that you can do that, uh, but you need to hear from God's Word in various ways at various times. And the last thing you do is share God's Word. If you want to make God's Word a priority in your life and you want to interact with it in another way, share it. Tell it to your kids. Tell it to your spouse. Tell it to your coworkers. Share it in church. Whatever, whatever the context is, share it with your neighbors. Sharing and having to communicate God's Word in conversations can help those truths to sink deeper into our hearts. So that's a priority as well. All right. Let me, let me push through. We're going to go through prayer. We can leave some things for next week. That's the reason I've not put outlines in your booklets is because I don't want you to have the dissatisfaction of blanks that aren't filled out for the entire week. So we'll, I'm, I'm going to start in prayer just for a few minutes, but we may have to come back to some of this next week. Again, totally fine. Uh, the focus of this class is not like a method for prayer. Exactly. I'm just trying to convince you that, that you need to have a plan and you need to do it. So what are some principles for prayer? First of all, we think about principles for prayer. Prayer is a conversation with God. Um, when Jesus models prayer for us in the Lord's Prayer, he says, Our Father who art in... Oh, I do it in King James because that's how I learned it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy is the second person. He's speaking to God in a conversation. Prayer is a conversation with God, but that means some stuff. So that, that means if it's a conversation with God, that means you're not the only person who speaks. That means that you're spoken to. And, and I remember what we mentioned before, that we want to give priority to what God says first. And so prayer is a, is a response to God's word. Prayer is a response to God's word. It assumes a relationship with God in Christ. So if you're not a believer, you can't just kind of pray generally to some God out there. But we pray through Christ to the Father. That's what Jesus models for us, and we see model it throughout the New Testament. So it assumes a relationship with God, and it is a serious commitment. This is not something to be taken lightly. It kills me when people are like, God, if you're out there, I, I hope that you'll just, and I'm like, what is that? And, and if you do this, please don't take me wrong, but like, this is just a personal thing. But I want to understand the majesty of God, and I don't want to just go say, say, hey, God, or hey, Daddy, or that, that kind of stuff. We've heard that. That's trying to express some of the intimacy of our relationship with God. It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's just for me, when I'm understanding the weight of what's there and the conversation that I'm having, I want to understand the intimacy of my relationship with God in Christ, but I also want to understand that I'm talking to the God of the universe. So I want to communicate that seriousness in my prayer. But, but regardless, we want to have that first piece there, that prayer is a conversation with God that begins with what God says. So as you order your spiritual disciplines within your day, start with Scripture and move to prayer. It's okay, by the way. If for some reason all you can handle is five minutes of scripture reading and then everybody's up and going and you have no time, it's okay to try to hold on to those truths that you're picking up in that five minutes of scripture reading that you picked up beside your bed in the morning before you hit the ground running and to come back to prayer when you have a time later in the day to do it. Just make a priority of doing it, but respond to God's word as you do it. Um, so I, I think I'm going to... I'm going to stop here because there's so much that I want to cover about prayer just in terms of the practice of prayer. Uh, and I don't want to waste time because I, I think we need to, we may have some questions about prayer just because we see examples of it and we do it, but we don't, I feel like I don't know a lot about prayer. I don't know a lot about what's going on and I don't do it very well because it's hard for me to slow down and do it. So I'm going to stop us there. We'll talk more about prayer as we get started next week. And it'll, I think it'll help us as well as we sort of transition into the discussion about rest. Uh, because, um, yeah, I think there's some connections there. Any questions about sort of centering the spiritual disciplines in your life? Any comments that you want to make? My challenge for you this week is that you... I want you to read the Bible. I hope I intend to. I want you to pray. I intend to. I really want you, though, as we come back next week, and I'll ask about it as we get started, to just try to identify that one time of the day that 
that is a, is a really effective time for you to engage in scripture reading and prayer. Um, and may it try to do it once. Test some different things. If you have the ability to do it, try different things every day of the week. But I want you to take that time and try to figure out what that best time is based on your body, based on your routines, based on your schedule, and so that you can give God your first and your best of your day. All right, let me pray for us, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this time that we've had this morning. Uh, I, I confess to you that I, I am a miserable failure in so many ways, uh, including in my prioritization of the spiritual disciplines. Lord, you, you have given us, you've spoken to us, and you continue to speak to us by your word, and, and you have invited me as your own child to speak to you through the person of Jesus Christ, and Lord, I don't take advantage of that. I don't do it like I should. Lord, in so many ways, I even know when the best time for it is, and I still don't do it. So, Lord, I ask that you would you would help me if, if we start to as I start to build this sort of vision for what living a life characterized by grace looks like. I just ask for your help. I ask that you would help me to do the things that I know that you've called me to do. And Lord, help us all to just place this priority of spending time with you, the living God of the universe. Help us to place that as, as our priority, as, as our singular priority uh, every day. That we might continue to grow in godliness and be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.